behalf of Great Lakes Institute of Management Chennai, it gives me great pleasure to reinvite our dear friend and a supporter, Mr. Narayan Murthy, uh, a legend by himself. Fortune magazine calls him as the father of IT in India. Actually, if he's father of the IT in India, there must be a mother also. So the mother of IT can't be F.C. Kohli, who unfortunately passed away just this November. And actually, I wrote a paper with, uh, with uh, T.C.S. Uh, Kohli and Mahalingam. And uh, Murthy said, look, you know, in what way you have neglected us? No, no, no. You, unfortunately, the paper finished was with Mohandas Pai and one of your employee in cost management. But they are taking more delay to publish. That's all. You know, generally, the, if, if you talk about a twin children, the earlier children comes later. Some earlier child comes later. So therefore, it is still Infosys. So anyway, I am so pleased to know it, this gentleman right from 1996, when Rohan was actually in high school and his mother was alive. And uh, it's a phenomenal family. The family feeling, which is our culture, is exactly a code in Infosys culture also. Everybody knows everybody. It's a question of uh, uh, you know, taking the wounded and taking support if anybody has any trouble, and of course, rejoicing the success. And that is the culture that he has developed. Many people say he's an IT guy. In my opinion, he's probably the best marketing person I have ever seen. As a matter of fact, this statement was not said by me. It's said by the legend marketing messiah of uh, marketing by name Phil Kotler himself, who visited. And after he saw the building and the way he was treated, and everybody knows everybody. This man knows that I have seen his face. I have seen the articles all over the place. But this is the first time I'm saying. And Nandan actually took him in the golf cart and showed him around. And he was amazed. So anyway, I am so pleased that uh, Mr. Murthy has done so much uh, starting as an uh, electrical engineer in National Institute of Engineering at Mysore and then got graduate work at IIT Kanpur. And he has given probably lectures in every graduation all over the place and a book has been assembled. And he was actually a speaker uh, as a, at one of the graduations. Not only him, I have the unique honor of not only him and his wife Sudha Murthy also as a graduation speaker. When Bernala was their governor, both of them were speaking. And he still I ring the word that not only passion, passion with compassion is more important, is there. He has blessed with two children, Akshata, a, a doctoral student and a close friend of my brother Shankar as Srinivasan at Stanford, who also met Rishi, who is now the chancellor of West Shaker, at uh, and also an MP at London. And, uh, and of course, uh, Rohan, as I know him from his high school. And then when he went for his college, actually Murthy was very keen on him joining in, uh, uh, in Northwestern itself, engineering school. But he finally chose Cornell. Uh, and he knows a friend of mine by name Srida. Both of us convinced him Cornell is even a better, beautiful place. And now what is happening to him? a doctorate and amazing work and creator of a lot of research. And this is one place where a father is proud if the son outperforms him. And uh, now between father and son, uh, Rastam and Sh Shorab, you know, amazing work. And uh, again, he was in various boards, HSBC, DBS, and uh, even United Nations and Ford Foundation and on and on I can go. Among all the awards, the most important award, I think, is his Padma Vibhushan from the government of India. And not even a single person was not seen. As a matter of fact, it was very difficult for me when Clinton was visiting. Clinton, both Clinton and Chelsea wanted to go to Infosys among all the places. Because, you know, of course, uh, Delhi was there due to political reasons. But Naidu was keen on making sure he comes to Hyderabad. So Chelsea went to, uh, and finally, uh, Clinton also went there. But the point is, 
such an important person has such a simple and humble feelings and the love that he has for great lakes at any time that i i ask for a, a help he is always there to help me without much ado let us give a very very warm welcome to the one and only the dearest friend father of it and a great friend of great lakes to our august body murthy olivers we will go through some other question we yeah. are planning to follow a sort of a town hall or a fireside chat or as we call it a power talk so we have some questions and it is better opti farmais it is better the questions of viewers come to him rather than he gives so i will start with the very first question uh, to him without losing any time uh, murthy we know a lot and we have done so much in this and now catamaran ventures what is the ideology behind your venture fund uh, catamaran ventures what exactly you want to accomplish in your second avatar what do you look for as an entrepreneur when you decide to fund any venture of your uh, liking and what exactly the variables you look for uh, first of all uh, professor balachandran other distinguished professors intellectuals and bright students it is an absolute privilege and a great honor for me to be participating in this event today thank you for your wonderful video and very kind words professor balachandran the the tagline at catamaran ventures is ideas to outcomes what that means is we want the entrepreneurs to come with ideas with bright ideas good ideas impactful ideas and it is our job to help them to convert them to outcomes we want to unleash the power of young indian minds to help them find solutions to the problems of education healthcare nutrition and shelter in india now let me tell you what we look for in an entrepreneur we look for competencies leadership learnability imagination courage a spirit of sacrifice deferred gratification and of course a sound value system now what do we mean by learnability i define learnability as the ability to extract generic inferences out of specific situations and use them for solving new unstructured problems that is why at emphasis i use the phrase powered by intellect driven by values intellect is what helps you to develop learnability and also in developing new competencies values are what help you become trustworthy team oriented courageous open minded fair transparent and austere they help you to make sacrifices be respectful of others opinions disagree without being disagreeable and put the interest of the organization ahead of one's own personal interest some of you will definitely become entrepreneurs you will transform this world you will transform this country in ways that i cannot imagine my best wishes to you to me entrepreneurship is about as i had said earlier transforming the power of an idea 
into jobs and wealth. Those are the outcomes that we look for when we select an entrepreneur. To succeed as an entrepreneur, you need to do the following. First, have an idea which has never occurred to anybody else in the world. Such ideas create discontinuity in the marketplace. Whether it's Facebook, Google, Microsoft, Uber, Amazon, and Netscape, Netscape. These are good examples of such ideas. However, such ideas are rare and most ideas improve upon existing ideas. If your idea is one such, make sure that your idea outperforms all existing ideas and products in cost, in productivity, comfort, cycle time, etc. In other words, it should have some clear distinct advantage. Second, you must be able to express the power of your idea in a simple sentence and not a complex, not a compound sentence. Why? Because anything that you can express in a simple sentence becomes easy for others to understand that is your customers to understand, your employees to understand, et cetera. Third, conduct an inexpensive, quick and simple test marketing exercise to assess whether your ideas will fly. Let me stop. <coughs> Thank you. Sanjay. Uh, good evening, sir. I am going to uh, ask a question which is essentially a compilation of uh, their sense of questions which many students have asked. Uh, I coordinate our one-year program where almost 80 to 85 percent of our students, they have uh, an IT yeah. to ITES uh, background yeah. uh, with around three and a half to five years of work experience in the IT sector. Yeah. And most of them are looking for a post MBA career as well in the IT sector. So yeah. in, a, the, in the minds of uh, a lot of our students, the question is, have Indian IT companies now moved up to the value chain to the maximum extent? Uh, that's a very important question. Excellent question. What do we mean by moving up the value chain in the software services industry? Let's understand that. It means doing work that has higher business value to our customers and therefore that will result in increased prices for our work. Otherwise, you're not moving up the value chain. First, as economists say, price is what you pay and value is what you get. Therefore, on the customer side, they must receive higher business value. And second, on the company side, on the vendor side, the vendor must get higher prices for his or her work and the per capita revenue productivity of the employees has to go higher and higher year after year. If we look at the per capita revenue addition of the employees of IT companies, this figure has either remained the same or has in fact reduced because companies have done lower value addition work like business process management. The per capita revenue, that is the revenue and earned per employee, today varies between US dollar 30,000 and perhaps $50,000 US. That is, if you look at the re total revenue of the company and divided it by the total number of employees, 
you look at any company, you look at Infosys, you look at TCS or anybody, these companies are probably around 50, 51,000, 52,000. And many other companies are lower, those that do more <coughs> the business process management work, they have remained at 30,000. And this figure has not changed significantly in the last 20 years. You know, the year 2000 and 2001 were the years when Infosys reached a figure of $100,000 of per capita revenue productivity. But that's when the, the, uh, the internet bubble burst and then it has gone. Now the reasons are two why it has come. One, we still remain reactive problem solvers, mostly in tech areas. That means the customer tell us what problem they have and then we say we will find a technical solution. This is reactive problem solving. Despite emphasis efforts in the early 2000s to focus on business value addition, that's what I tried to do, and business value leverage, that is value added in US dollar to the customer for every dollar of price that we charge to the customer. That is the value delivered to the customer divided by the price that you charge to the customer. When you look at this business value leverage, we have continued to be around the same and we have continued to be technology focused. Our education system has not helped Indian youngsters to become proactive problem recognizers and problem solvers. The Indian mindset has not evolved to sell the business value to our customers. Our salespeople sell mostly on price, and we reduce every market to a commodity market. I think that is the reality. Very good, yeah. very good. Thank you very much. Suresh. Yeah, that's, uh, that's indeed very, very profound, uh, Mr. Murthy. And this is, I think, uh, a challenge for all educational institutions, uh, I'm sure, yeah. you know, as we think about what we need to do. Uh, but I would like to... Uh, pivot to a question that draws more from your personal experience and uh, you know what what you have uh, you know undergone all these years and and you know the experiences that you have had and you have often said that you have been incredibly lucky in life and the question yeah. is is interesting here which says that yeah you know uh, what happens if if your luck seems to desert you despite the fact that you actually feel that you deserve something but your luck has deserted you so when you take a role of a leader, how do you remain positive under these circumstances and, and you know, uh, when we don't have control over the situation that we are facing? So how do we basically use our luck uh, you know, to our advantage if, if we can? Well, this is a very tough question. Let me try and answer to the best of my ability. Yes, I believe God has been very kind to me and to emphasis. There were lots of my classmates who were much smarter than me. There were a lot of entrepreneurs who had much better ideas than I did have, but they did not get the opportunities that I got. Therefore, it is fair to say that God chose to smile on me much more than many other people. Therefore, I believe that luck is very important for an entrepreneur to succeed. All other things being equal, you need luck, which is in some way God's blessings. Of course, you have to have attributes like a good idea, a good value system, hard work, discipline, 
sacrifice, teamwork, and deferred gratification. But none of these things will work if you do not have luck. You know, uh, actually, uh, it was Louis Pasteur who put it much better than I did. He said, chance favors the prepared mind. Therefore, it is very important that you youngsters first work hard and then pray for God's blessings. There were many situations at emphasis in sales. I can think of sales. There are many other situations. When we thought we did better than our competitors, but it, we, we didn't win the deal. There were many situations where we didn't think we did as well as we could have but we won the deal. Now these things happen, but we look at them as part of the game. That is an important mindset that you people have to develop. You must accept that there will always be pluses and minuses, successes and failures in entrepreneurship as it happens in life. There, there will be many setbacks, but I want you people to look at it as God's will and say that God wants you to work harder and become smarter. This is also what we call developing maturity. Now, when these things happen, when you fail, and I have failed, therefore, I can give you an example. It is important to sit down and introspect why I failed or why one failed and ascertain the reasons. For example, I founded a company called Softronics in 1976. And I realized that there was no market and I that was going into a situation where there was no uh, success possible and it failed. Therefore, I sat down, I analyzed and understood that the domestic market for software development in 1976 was very limited and that if I wanted to succeed, I realized that I had to focus on export market. I also realized that entering the export market was an expensive proposition and that we needed a constant stream of disposable income from data center operation in India. So the key is to introspect, analyze, decide on the next step and act rather than feeling sad for oneself. Uh, that's what I did. And that's what I would say that anybody who <coughs> uh, encounters failure or encounters lack of success to the extent that you want, that's the attitude you will have to take because God is not finished with you. And we have to say that failure is a step to success as long as you recognize it quickly and as long as you take the required steps in your next venture. That's what I would say. Thank you. Thank, thank you very much. Actually, Murthy, I used to tell my students a simple word by be, be positive. By being positive, I cannot guarantee success. But yeah. by being negative, I guarantee failure. <laughs> so, unfortunately, I am born with a blood group called B positive. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, anyway, it's a good um, but, 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 uh, many, many, many of the students are really getting into this entrepreneurship and so. There are too many questions. So let me have the next question of mine uh, on yeah. again entrepreneurs. 
Yeah. Uh, as an, I do not know whether you know this. Uh, the Atal Innovation Mission created some uh, incubators in top schools, both engineering mm. and business. They are selected about four or five business schools. We are having yeah. a school, uh, an incubator called Atal Innovation Mission, Great Lakes Balachandran yeah. Incubator Center. Yeah. So we are training yeah. some entrepreneurs also while they are yeah. students in that. Yeah. So many other, that is why the questions are that way. How, the, the yeah. next question is this, how should an entrepreneur handle multiple roles that he, she has to perform, especially in the initial stages when the cash burning rate is high? Which function can be delegated and which should not be and could not be according to you? Well, again, this is another well thought out question. When I founded Infosys, I got together six younger colleagues of mine. They were hardly, they had hardly one or two years of experience. Actually, I had recruited almost every one of them. My philosophy has always been to pick bright youngsters with good learnability, give them huge responsibility, review constantly, and give them opportunity to develop. That was what I did. I recognized in each of them certain strengths. My colleague Raghavan was people-oriented, and therefore, I gave him the responsibility of our HR. Nandan was good in communication, and therefore, I gave him responsibility for marketing, sales and marketing. Chris Gopalakrishnan and Ashok Arora were good in technology. So I put them in, in charge of new technology. Mr. Shibulal and Mr. Dinesh were very good in project management. Dinesh was also very good in details orientation and therefore I put him in charge of quality. I took responsibility for finance and sales. I also spent most of my time in reviewing in helping my younger colleagues develop checklists in their area of operation and to have constant discussions with me. Whatever problems they had, they had to come to me. We would together as a team try to find a solution and we constantly improved upon what they were doing. Now you can delegate any function, as long as your colleagues have high learnability, <coughs> they work hard, they are disciplined, and they develop checklists. You know, checklists are extremely useful in improving work productivity. Uh, as you people know, Dr. Atul Gawande, a professor at Harvard's School of Medicine, he has written a book called Checklist. I think many of you must have read that. And he says, when he wrote that book, when he spoke about checklists, a lot of hospitals in the US didn't accept his ideas. But once he produced the book and once they read and once they applied it, 99% of the infections in the operations theater got eliminated. Similarly, my view is whenever you do something new, before you do it, sit down with the senior most in your group and where necessary, have two or three people discuss and debate and understand the do's and don'ts 
and develop a checklist and put it in a reusable knowledge management system. Today, it's all very easily available. It doesn't cost much money. So that you can train new people very easily on new skills. See, what is difficult to train is wisdom, maturity. However, skills can always be developed easily. Therefore, I would not delegate wisdom and maturity. You can't delegate it in any case. Yeah. However, skills can be delegated if you review them constantly before they do the job and when they are doing and make sure that they create artifacts in the knowledge management system. And I also have some kind of a bias that is I always preferred learnability over experience in so far as skills are concerned. However, maturity, wisdom, mentoring, these things can't be delegated. Handling crisis, these things can't be delegated. Very good, very good. Sanjay. Yes, sir. Uh, sir, this question uh, goes beyond entrepreneurship and the IT industry. It actually uh, draws on your vision and your experience and all the things that you have said about the overall state of the Indian economy, uh, which goes much, much beyond the IT industries. The question is that when you look at engineering colleges today, whether they are the best or even good engineering colleges, almost 90% of the students who are recruited, the undergraduates, they go to the IT companies. And this student's concern is that students obviously choose the IT companies because for employment, because they offer them higher CTCs. But at the same time, the downside of it is that we are losing talent or depriving the country of top engineers in the hardcore engineering areas like automobiles, oil, utilities, construction, etc. So do you feel that there is uh, a solution to kind of somehow, I will not use the word correct, but uh, to take care of this imbalance in a country where we still lack top level talent uh, in a whole lot of areas uh, which we st still consider traditional. Well, you know, this tendency of some growing and highly profitable sectors of the economy paying better than the mature industries is a common phenomenon all over the world. You know, my brother-in-law is a very successful professor of astrophysics at Caltech. I mean, he has been there for whatever, 37 years or something, whatever. Now, many of his very bright, very successful PhDs, students in astronomy, they go and join the Wall Street firms. Once upon a time, IT companies like Infosys and TCS paid much better than companies in the automobile sector. The students of Great Lakes will get better salaries than their classmates who did not do management studies. That's a reality. Now, here also, most of your students are engineers. Now, let's come to the today's situation. Offshore captives of high-tech MNCs pay better than the Indian IT companies, better than Infosys, better than TCS, better than Wipro, etc. 
This is a natural phenomenon. We simply have to accept it. We simply have to produce more and more engineers. We cannot mandate that students have to join only certain sectors of the economy. Mechanical engineering students should go only to the mechanical engineering sector of the economy. Electrical engineers should go only to electrical engineering sector of the economy. You can't do that because every Ilniakun V, as uh, I think it was Emily Zola uh, said, there's only one life. So therefore you cannot mandate that your students join only certain companies. The companies that are suffering, they have to sit down and they have to think how to make the career for incoming talent more attractive to them than the IT industry. They have to make workplace a fun and they have to make the job a learning experience. Second, the companies from these industries will have to go to colleges and make attractive presentations to the students and sell their jobs. Of course, they also have to uh, provide better compensation because that's a market. You see, you when the when the market is there, you either you are in the market and compete or you get out of the market. Now, one of the things that happened in the US, Professor Balachandran is a better person to comment on it. Sometime in the late 80s, the same thing happened to academia in the US, that people started going to Wall Street and others, and the salaries of the academic institutions were seen as not attractive. The universities quickly took action and they increased it. So I have found that lots of students prefer a career where they can learn much yeah. to those dumb jobs that pay them well. I have come across a lot of such students. Third, our engineering curriculum has to keep pace with time and make these curricula more attractive to students and suited to the needs of our various industries. Fourth, the companies in these non-IT industries must mount good in-company training programs for the incoming talent so that even the not so capable students can pick up the engineering skills needed for those industries because the really smart ones have gone to those companies that pay them very well. I mean, the reality is today, all you management schools, you attract the better part of the talent, the better section of the talent, because your students get better jobs once they pass out of schools like yours. That's a reality. Yes. So what happens is the industry, engineering industry gets not so capable students. So therefore it is their responsibility to make sure that they are well trained to be up to the job. That's what I would say. That's what we have done at Infosys. Very good, very good. Thank you. I'm so pleased to hear that. <clears throat> this is Thank a you. dilemma all of us face, you know, what yeah. to do with engineering, not doing this, and how do we give enough information. Now, the next question is essentially something uh, a student really feel, many students feel that way, you know, the mentor is a very important person in somebody's life. So if one were to have the immense good fortune to be mentored by you, to become a business leader later on, what are the top qualities you would look for the aspiring candidates and be acceptable to you as one of your prodigies, if you want to take, take one? Well, 
Yeah, I think. Uh, and there are there are seven hundred and eighty participants looking for this answer. <laughs> well, first of all, you people have been very kind to be to say those words. We did have a good mentoring system at Infosys. Mentoring at Infosys was a private relationship between the mentor and the mentee. The mentor was chosen not by the you know was chosen not by a committee, but by the mentee, and not by the mentor. Each internal board member had to accept five to six mentees. They could not refuse any mentee as long as the first come first serve policy was followed. The mentors would spend about an hour a month with each mentee. The mentee would bring their official or personal problems to the mentor. The mentors would use the distilled wisdom of their experience to offer suggestions or remedies to the problems posed by the mentees. Now, so therefore, I would not say that only this kind of a fellow can come to me to become a mentee, because in the environment that I operated, it was the mentee who chose rather than the mentor. Wow. That's interesting. That's very interesting. Actually, I nowadays call something called reverse mentoring that every mm -hmm. senior like us, age yeah. uh, 75 or more, mm -hmm. a 17 or 18 year old guy who is currently mm -hmm. amazingly aware and never afraid mm -hmm. of asking any questions. You know, and yeah. you don't worry about uh, uh, hierarchy or age and this and that. Yes. And I think both can learn forever as a team. Anyway, Sanjay, it's yours. Yeah. Sanjay, you are unmute. Sanjay, you have to uh, unmute. Yes. Uh, so the next question is something which Mr. Murthy has already answered, which was about Softronics and mm -hmm. what the failure of Softronics yeah. uh, basically taught him in his journey of life and, uh, you know, in how he looks at entrepreneurship and the issue of chance and luck. Mm -hmm. uh, so, so maybe I'll, I'm interested so what in maybe I'll go on next is, one then. Uh, the dean to, yeah. uh, you know, go ahead with the next question. Sure. I'll do that. So this is a personal favorite of mine now, Mr. Murthy. Uh, having gone oh. through the IITs and the IIMs, uh, you know, and the system here, uh, this question is, you know, about despite having such really high quality, higher education institutions such as the IITs and IIMs in this country, uh, why is it that we are lagging behind in research and innovation? Uh, you know, what is the problem that uh, prevents us from basically rising up in research rankings and research productivity uh, and, and originality of thinking. And so that is, I think, a, a fundamental question. And second, as a corollary to that, do you really believe that uh, the new education policy that has been announced uh, will address some of these concerns? I am very happy about the new education policy. It aims to improve the quality of education in the country. My friend, Dr. Kasture Rangan, headed the committee. And my son's friend, Dr. Manjal Bhargav, was part of it. We must recognize that the need of the day is to transform our children from reactive and apathetic people to proactive problem recognizers and problem solvers. That is the most important need of India. You know, I gave a convocation address at IASC a few years ago. 
And when I accepted that invitation from the director of IIC, I was sitting at MIT with a professor. And I asked him what I should speak on. He gave a pamphlet, uh, he gave a booklet called the 100 innovations that came out of IIT or something like that, inventions and innovations that came out of IIT. And he said, introspect what innovations or inventions have come out of IAC and what is it that they can do. So I spoke on that. I listed 10 top inventions that came from the students of MIT. And I realized that there was really no major invention that had come from IAC or IITs, any of them. IITs are reasonably good education schools. They, they don't do much research. Now, the reason is because we are, our whole mindset, starting from the birth till we die, is to be reactive and apathetic to problems around us. On the other hand, a good education should give our children the ability to learn to learn. Learning is about observing one's context, understand the nature around us as it is, reason out why it is so, and use the power of human mind to overcome the limitations of nature. You people know better than I do that it was the unusual trajectory of Mercury round sun that Einstein observed and that led to the general theory of relativity. It first, of course, came out with special theory, and then he came out with general theory of relativity. Now, he knew that, uh, that you know, it is not like Pluto or something which was far away. Therefore, some other thing was, uh, you know, making Mercury go around uh, in a funny way because it was right next to sun. I think somewhere around 32 million miles from the sun or something like that. I don't remember. It's around that distance. So then he started thinking. Similarly, more than 120 years ago, people asked why one was not able to hear what was said 100 miles from where they were. So they started thinking about it. And of course, we know that, that that thing led to the invention of telephone, Graham Bell and others, right? Similarly, another set of people about 80 years, probably 85 years ago, asked, why can't we see what is happening 100 miles from where we are? And the result was television. Therefore, we have to instill in the minds of our youngsters curiosity, problem solving, daring, open mindedness, pluralism, respect for others' opinions and views, respect for other cultures, not being afraid of learning from outside India, logical and and Socratic questioning in our children, not just in the schools, but even at home. Unless we bring about such a change in the mindset, I don't know if any education policy <coughs> will indeed help our youngsters. That is my view. So this will require a huge effort but it is worth taking, taking up. As I already said, I think there is an attempt by the new education policy 
to help our children in some way. But the bigger challenge is how we instill in the minds of our youngsters right from the time they were born, curiosity, problem solving, daring, open-mindedness, pluralism, et cetera, et cetera. If our culture can embrace that and not say, no, 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 you have to simply listen to the elders, you have to do what they say, you know, don't question elders. I think this culture has to change and only when this thing changes, and we have to have open book examinations in our uh, open book examinations in our schools and colleges. I think we did all of that. You know, one of the good things that I like about the research in the US universities, this is what my son told me. I asked him, what was the most difficult thing that you had when you did your PhD? He said the biggest, the, the most difficult challenge I had was to define my own problem. problem. That problem must be big enough to solve some worthwhile issue and to get my PhD, but it must be small enough to complete it in five or six years. The professor will not he told me the professor will simply not help you in defining the problem. That's right. I think right. if if we get to that kind of thinking at the research level, at the PhD level, and if we get to open book examinations, if we get to Socratic questioning in classrooms, et cetera, I think we will be in a position to handle these issues well. But as I said, you know, knowing Dr. Kasturi Rangan and then, you know, knowing uh, Manjul Bhargav and others, I think they have done a good job under the circumstances. Thank you. Thank you. Sanjay, is the student asking or you are? Yes, yes, yes. So the last question is uh, a question which is not a very typical question which is asked by an MBA. It focuses a little bit on issue, issues of uh, social inequality. Uh, yeah. So I would ask the student who had, who is the original author of this question, sure. to ask this question to you. Karthik, can you please unmute yourself and turn on your video, please? Uh, yes, sir. Thank you so much uh, for the you. opportunity. Uh, thank you, sir, for taking time out from your busy schedule and taking up this session. So my question touches upon the, the topic of compensation that you had talked upon earlier. So you had said in the past that the managerial remuneration has to be a fair multiple of the compensation of the lowest level employee in the company. So in your opinion, should the floor be raised or the ceilings be lowered? Well, I think that is again a good question. I believe that managerial remuneration should be based on three fundamental principles. A fair multiple of the compensation of the lowest level employee in the company. Second, full transparency on details of such compensation to all the shareholders. And third, accountability by linking the variable part of the compensation with long-term performance of the company. These days, most experts believe that a ratio of 70 to 80 between the compensation of the CEO and the median salary of the company seems fair. In some well-run global corporations, the compensation of the CEO is discussed with a few top shareholders and their opinion is considered before a decision is made. Unfortunately, in India, it is not made. After that, it is placed before the shareholders for their approval at an AGM or EGM. Now, coming back to your second part of the question, 
my view is that the best way to bring down the ratio between the compensation of the CEO and the compensation of the lowest level employee is to increase the floor level for employee compensation. In many cases, we will have to reduce the compensation at the highest level. When it has gone out of whack, as it has happened in some companies, also we must remember that no leader can succeed in a vacuum. That's the reality. I have not come across any leader who is alone in a company and then says everything in this company is because of me and therefore give me huge salary. He or she will have to get the cooperation, innovation, hard work and commitment of every employee of the company for the company to succeed. Finally, I believe that capitalism is new to India. There are lots of questions about capitalists in India. Lots of comments on Twitter, Facebook, this, that, etc. We are culturally, we're culturally oriented towards the underdogs, towards the unfortunate ones, towards those at the bottom of the pyramid. Therefore, it is a good idea for the senior management of companies to voluntarily or to show a certain self-restraint in in taking up for themselves an unjustifiable share of the compensation pool. And the good thing with, with this is when employees realize that the senior management is doing such a thing, they're showing fairness in such matters, then you can create an environment of joy, confidence, hope, and enthusiasm among the employees. That's what I would say. Thank you very much. So I think uh, Suresh, yeah. just time. Yeah. Of time. Yeah. So uh, Mr. Murthy, first of all, let me express my uh, profound gratitude to you for taking the time uh, to come and share all your thoughts with, uh, with everyone here. I think every, each one of us, I think took something, uh, you know, very unique as a lesson that we could learn for ourselves in, uh, you know, in how we conduct ourselves, uh, how we should approach life in general. I think your, your wisdom on, on learnability and, you know, you know, that the fact that, you know, we need to focus on how we basically, uh, you know, embrace this idea of learnability that, you know, we, we look at what we learn and how we can learn and apply it to unfamiliar situations. I think that is, I think it would resonate from, uh, you know, with everybody from, you know, a, a young student, I, you know, there was someone who texted me who was from, uh, from 12th grade who was sitting in and, and listening to, to this talk. And, and of course we have people here who are like, you know, 50 plus or 60 plus, and I think you'd never stop learning. And I think that is, uh, is a profound lesson for all of us. Uh, you touched upon the importance of values. You touched upon the uh, the importance that you know uh, we have to always strive to maintain uh, that sense of balance and you know not not uh, go completely uh, off kilter on on these things. Uh, so there are uh, you know lot of very interesting lessons that you know we all learned today uh, from an educational institution standpoint. You touched upon the idea of uh, uh, you know uh, you know originality of thinking. Uh, about how to challenge ourselves, about how to uh, think about problem solving rather than simply just focusing on, uh, you know, uh, reactive uh, elements of how we respond to problems rather than trying to think, uh, uh, to recognize a problem and make sure that it doesn't arise in the first place. These are all, I think, very important lessons, particularly for graduates of this institution, uh, you know, who are about to graduate uh, and, and, you know, join companies. Uh, this approach to thinking about problems about how to anticipate them and how to basically approach things in a creative way uh, is, is a lesson that I think all of us should embrace. Uh, 
uh, and uh, so I really uh, want to thank you uh, very, very much for uh, this uh, excellent one hour that you spent with us. I really wish that you know we could spend a lot more time, uh, you know, picking your brains and and learning a lot more from you, sir. But I look forward to being able to welcome you again to campus once campus, uh, you know, once you know we are in full swing. And you know, if you are able to come back to campus, it would be our distinct honor to welcome you back. And I would get a chance to share some more, uh, or you know, to to get more of your wisdom from you, sir. Thank you very, very much. Thanks, uh, Professor Ranamathan. I'm very, very grateful to every one of you. Thanks a lot. Thanks to everybody. Thank you. All the best. Thank you, Good sir. luck.